啊，那个早上好，大家早上好，我叫葛莹，对我是来自威斯康星的啊，多谢万星的邀请哈，非常感激万星给我们那个报道我们的工作啊，我虽然平常说中文挺好的，可以，但是呃专业术语还是不太好，所以我可能这个讲座还是用英文给。Um, so uh, actually, uh, everyone, great. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the uh, novel strategies in top-down proteomics that we have recently developed towards um, precision medicine. Um, so as you know, uh, my lab is a place where chemistry meets with biology and medicine. I worked in the pharmaceutical company for a while, and I really am uh, excited about the um, you know multidisciplinary environment. So when I had a chance to establish my own lab. Uh, I would like to, um, you know, uh, integrate the chemistry and the biology together. So I have a chemistry student working on developing um, proteomics and metabolomics technologies, and uh, the biology students are utilizing these uh, technologies to address biological questions, um, such as filament, metabolism, and GPCR signaling. Um, I also have an MD PhD student uh, connect us to the clinic. But uh, uh, you know, regardless, they are chemistry students, biology students, or medical school students. They all have to learn math spectrometry. So um, we are really interested to establish, you know, establish multi-omics technologies for precision medicine, and utilizing the power of omics technology to decipher the complexity of biological system. Let me get. The um, and understand the disease mechanism. We like to decipher the network at the organ level, at the cellular level, and the molecular level. Um, my lab focused on proteomics. Um, now we um, started to um, perform some metabolomics. Our goal is to integrate the omics with the in vitro and in vivo functions and towards precision medicine. So um, why top-down proteomics? As we know, unlike the genome, Proteome is very complex, and the one gene can be alternate splice into uh, many mRNAs, and all kinds of post-translational modification could occur to the protein, such as um, phosphorylation, acetylation, glycosylation, methylation, and lots of acylations, as you might know, like uh, developed by Yiming Zhao's lab. Um, so uh, overall, there are a lot more proteoform in the proteome than the gene in the genome. Uh, again. The genome is static, it's a blueprint, and proteome is dynamic and uh, real-life building blocks. So in top-down proteomics, we used to characterize the proteoform. So what is a proteoform? The proteoform, we say they're from the same gene, but different mutations, different alternate splicing isoforms, and also post-translational modifications. So in the top-down proteomics, we take the whole protein, uh, in tech, without digestion, so we to put them into the mass spectrometer. Then you can see all kinds of post-translational modifications like phosphorylation, acetylation, and together with mutation and alternative splicing isoform. So these are the instruments that we currently use in the lab for top-down proteomics. Um, and so for, for some of you know that you know QTOFs, FTICR, they're actually really good. Um, instrument for top-down proteomics. So this slide just give you an example how we use top-down to decipher the proteome complexity by um, these high-resolution mass spectrometry. So this is the SDS gel that shows a nice uh, pure band of a cardiac troponin I, which is uh, you know cardiac biomarker. And if it in gel, it shows pretty few pieces. But if you look at the mass spectrometry. There are so many different <laughs> peaks, so um, you know, don't get a heart attack. They are all cardiac troponin I, but different modified forms. This is a full length troponin I with acetylation. This is a phosphorylation, and this is a degradation products. And these degradation products could also have the ability to be phosphorylated, and they also all kinds of you know oxidation could occur. So overall, there. Are for this one protein, there are 30 different proteoforms uh, observed, we call it for the single gene product. 
So we know these phosphorylations and uh, you know different post-translation modification. Can we then the question is can we use the mass cardiac you know um, as a biomarker for diagnosis? The answer um, from what our data shows is actually yes. Um, so you can see there's a phosphorylation of a cardiac troponin I. They started to degrade. Uh, decrease in within the severity of the disease, um, like in the you know uh, hypertrophy, it started to decrease to the end. The congestive heart failure is actually completely gone. So these phosphorylations, uh, we know at the certain 22, 23, they are well known to regulate uh, the protein, um, you know, contractility in the muscle. So using those high resolution tender mass spectrometry we can nail down the site of modification. And also, because of the high resolution, it offers high mass accuracy. So we can distinguish um, you know, very small changes, um, like, like differences like cytolation and trimethylation, which is only 0.036 Dalton difference. So in the heart, we have this example. Uh, this protein called regulatory light chain, when it is expressed in the atria, it has the uh, acetylation, but when it you know expressed in ventricle, it was different to heart chamber. It is now has a trimethylation. This also implies different function. So as we know, this top-down proteomics, the top is we said measuring the intact molecular mass, and down is fragmenting the intact proteins. Um, as we know, getting to the top isn't easy if you have ever climbed, you know, mountains. And getting down isn't very easy too. So what do we really need as the, what do we call lift, which, which is, you know, technologies. And also um, skills, like, you know, we train graduate students at the beginning how to do um, protein chemistry. Uh, so while we have, uh, you know, established technologies, um, in the front end, sample preparation, separation of intact proteins, and middle part, top-down analysis of intact proteins, and back end bioinformatics. Okay, so we have um, focused on these novel approaches to address the challenges in top-down proteomics. Um, the protein solubility, that as you know, a lot of proteins, you have to solubilize them with SDS, and, but it is not compatible with mass spectrometry. So we are trying to develop the new top-down MS compatible surfactant and to address proteome complexity. As you know, there's intact protein chromatography underdeveloped. So we are trying to develop multi, um, novel multi-dimensional chromatography for intact protein separation. We have made quite a lot of progress in the past six years. And regarding the proteome dynamic range, you know, even <laughs> you have a multidimensional chromatography, it is still very difficult to detect low bandness proteins. And traditionally, you use antibody, but you know they are um, expensive and also then not as a, you know as specific as we wish to be. So we had develop uh, developing these novel nanomaterials for enriching low bandness proteins. And also, we have uh, established uh, this uh, mesh uh, pro software that help you um, analyze the top-down uh, top -down data. So after many years of uh, you know, exploration, we finally uh, developed this photocleavable surfactant for top-down prote proteomics. So this, uh, in case these photocleavable bond, you insert a photocleavable bond in between the uh, hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. They function no less as the SDS analog, but uh, after you solubilize the proteins and before the mass spectrometry, we use a, you know, UV to degrade these um, photocleavable surfactant so they no longer um, act as surfactants and will not suppress the signal. Um, so Using this um, ASO, we uh, have uh, enriched a lot of mitochondria proteins, and including those in the electron transport chain, which actually know to heavily involved in the metabolism. So um, again, with this ASO, we have shown that it can, um, you know, 
allow us to identify those membrane proteins. For example, this phospholimbium, we identify the permutulation together with phospholation. Permutulimbium uh, is a really too small, probably for bottom up to detect, and too hydrophobic for top down. So with the azo now, we can um, completely uh, identify this protein. We also have recovered all different subunits for this ATP uh, synthesis. And then we submitted the paper to, review, to, to the journal and the review asked, can you replace the SDS with ASO page? And the good news is we actually completely replaced the SDS with ASO. So this is ASO used uh, uh, as, you know, in the, in the SDS gel um, to replace the SDS. So this essentially we show this broad impact beyond the proteomics. And recently, we have demonstrated that ASO can use the, as an all-in-one MS-compatible surfactant for both top-down and bottom-up proteomics. So um, you actually can extract the proteins with the ASO. Uh, and the ASO can also help um, enhance the, uh, the digestion, accelerate the digestion time. So as you can see, within less than you know, an hour, that you can completely degrade the ASO, and even like uh, half an hour is okay. So this enabled what we call high throughput proteomics in the bottom-up approach, and um, this is really going to help with clinical, you know, sample diagnosis. Uh, again, recently we have extended the use of ASO to uh, analyze extracellular matrix proteins. As you know, these ECM proteins play a very important role in tumor metastasis. And with the ASO, we have uh, recovered uh, a lot of, uh, you know, extracellular matrix proteins, such as collagen, uh, fibrin, fibronectin, and uh, a lot of other, um, you know, ECM proteins. So this also paper just recently published, if you're interested. And now I'm going to switch gear to talk about chromatography. We know the chromatography, you know, separation of antiproteins is challenging. Unlike peptides, the proteins has a much more diverse range of physical chemical properties. This provides us the opportunity to develop multidimensional chromatography incorporating mutually orthogonal mode. Um, we have um, developed uh, really the hydrophobic interaction chromatography uh, a mass spec to be mass spec compatible. And um, also, we spent time on the ion exchange chromatography and the uh, SE size exclusion. So you can really uh, integrate these orthogonal mode of chromatography together for our protein separation. Um, particularly, we're interested in a HIC. It is not HILIC. It's a HIC as a hydrophobic interaction chromatography, and a HILIC is a hydrophilic interaction chromatography. We like a HIC because it mainly uses aqueous, aqueous buffer for um, separation. So it can retain uh, the protein native structure under non denaturing conditions. But traditionally, it used a high concentration of non-volatile salt, high in hepsomata series, uh, such as ammonium sulfate and sodium sulfate. So traditionally, HIC is not compatible with mass spectrometry. Uh, with collaboration with Andy Alpert, we, uh, my students, B. Fine Chain, now working in Genanta, uh, he developed this new series of more hydrophobic uh, a HIC material that can retain proteins using mass by compatible concentration of ammonium acetate. As you can see, with the use of the ammonium acetate, you can directly spray using online LCMS, HIC-MS, and separate the protein. HIC is very... Um, sensitive to protein modifications. You can separate protein modification nicely in the mass spectrometry. And we also utilize this uh, HIC, online HIC-MS for analysis of anti-monoclonal antibodies. You can see they can separate those intact antibodies and then we can uh, identify the monomer, dimer, trimer, as well as all kinds of glycosylation. Um, we also could deglycosylate and glycosylate the, the monoclonal antibody and see their uh, mass shift in the mass spectrometry. Using online electron capture dissociation mass spectrometry, we'll be able to fragment and really identify the very critical uh, drug binding region. 
So um, as some of you know that uh, it's very difficult to really identify the larger proteins because of the uh, you know, exponential decrease in the signal to noise with increasing molecular weight. So you, when you, in order to detect large proteins, you will need to use these size separation technologies to separate a large protein from a smaller size proteins. Uh, my student, Trisha, uh, has developed this uh, serial size exclusion chromatography that achieved a very good separation. As you can see with 1D and uh, uh, reverse phase chromatography, we mostly can identify the proteins below 50 kilodalton. You can see very nice, um, you know, far, you know, a little different uh, modified forms. Um, but with this um, serial size exclusion chromatography, allow us to observe proteins larger than 60 kilodalton. Uh, for example, we have uh, be able to observe the proteins as large as 223 kilodalton mycine heavy chain and um, 140 kilodalton cardiac mycine binding protein C. Okay, now I'm going to switch gear again to talk about low balance proteins, right? Those are really low balance proteins, especially in the blood, they're, you know, that very high uh, albumin. So in this case, we have uh, tried to develop these nanomaterials for enriching low balance proteins. Uh, we engineered these nanoparticles. They have similar size as antibody. They have high capturing capacity due to the high surface area of nanoparticles and a high binding affinity due to these antibody-like multivalency. Um, so we allowed it, us to um, really enrich proteins and preserve these uh, protein activity. Uh, we have shown that when we use these functionalized uh, nanoparticles um, coupled with um, LCMS-MS, we can um, actually um, perform the top-down phosphoproteomic. Um, after enrichment, we could uh, use um, LC-MS-MS, tandem mass spectrometry. As you can see, this is after enrichment, this is the before enrichment, and the pro how fast the proteins cannot be detected without enrichment. After enrichment, you can then fragment them and identify the site of modification. Again, then come back to solve the real problem in blood. How do you detect the low bonus protein, such as the troponin, which is a biomarker that we have focused on? So we engineered this um, functionalized nanoparticles with a modification of the surface uh, with this troponin affinity peptide binders. Then we can reach the uh, cardiac troponin from tissue in the blood and then try to analyze the eluded, enriched um, samples by LCMS. As you can see, we can actually enrich these doubly phosphate troponin I, monoly phosphorylated and uh, no phosphorylation troponin I, as well as degraded product. So we can provide a much more accurate and detailed um, proteoform map for those proteins. So in comparison, that we actually in the using antibody it did not recover as much as the as many of the proteoform as we can. So we are pleasantly surprised by our performance of nanoparticle, which actually better performed than the antibody. So uh, we recently published this paper and showed these uh, nanoproteomics enable the proteoform resolved analysis of low balance proteins in the human serum. And we use that, the, you know, troponin I spike in the blood, and then um, try to enrich troponin I. And as I said, we are very happy to see during the enrichment of troponin I, it also depleted this um, human serum albumin. What this allows us to observe the detail, the molecular level of the we call molecular signature of the troponin I from patients. And that uh, can be used as a signature of um, you know, more detailed information for precision medicine. As you can see, these are the troponin I from a healthy patient, uh, healthy individuals. These are from uh, diseased patients. And these are actually postmodern samples. So essentially, each of different categories of the samples have different signature. 
Okay, these are the, you know, work done by my uh, students, David Roberts, a material chemistry student, and Tim Tiemann, chemical biology student. Again, this um, mass spec assay provides a lot more information than the traditional um, troponin ELISA assay. Okay, lastly, we have developed these um, technologies, really, um, you know, um, the uh, informatics to help analysis the mass spec data. We have uh, developed this Mesh Pro uh, Explorer. Uh, this is um, a comprehensive and universal software environment for top-down proteomics. Uh, most importantly, it's free. So if you want to process data, you know, thermal broker or others, you can all use the software. It also has different algorithm deconvolution. Uh, so we also have published this paper, and feel free to contact us if you would like to use the software. We'll be happy to help you. Okay, so um, within the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to quickly tell you a little bit about our biology program. Uh, in our biology students are utilizing these uh, large animal models in the human clinical samples to study heart failure. And we focused on the early stage heart attack and also on the cardiac contractile proteins. We have uh, established this LCMS-based top-down quantitative pro proteome form, uh, platform to uh, analyze the, you know, the, the tissue samples that are as small as 5 milligrams. And then we can get LCMS and uh, do um, comprehensive protein characterization and correlate the PTN with disease. When we establish this acute myocardial infarction model in SWAN to mimic human heart attack uh, with the left anterior descending aorta for 90 minutes, uh, we have shown that we can see the, you know, the troponin I phosphorylation as a key markers for these AMI pig samples. And interestingly, these AMI, you know, myocardial infarction heart attack induced the modification can be fully recovered by stem cell therapy. This provides a molecular level evidence to sh support um, the cardiac regeneration. Um, we recently also show for this disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is known as genetic disease, but there are so many different genotypes, like 14 different types. So it is really difficult for doctor to um, and, you know, to uh, prescribe medication for each patient uh, for the therapy. So our data in the proteomics level actually show their common pathways activated to precipitate similar clinical phenotype in this kind called obstructive HCM patients, independent HCM causing mutations. This opens door to interventions targeting the HCM phenotype rather than the specific genotype. What this tells us is the protein level of information is much, much more precise and accurate than the genome type information. We also try to use this patient-specific um, stem cell uh, derived, induced as pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes for precision medicine. You can take these patients as well as their family members with controls and differentiate into um, cardiomyocytes, and then can measure the proteomics and the function. And again, that's, we show that top-down can be used to analyze these IPL cell-derived cardiomyocytes um, and quantify both expression level and PTMs. Okay, so overall, we try to decoding human heart proteome by top-down proteomics. We have um, spent a lot of time on the cardiosacomere. And well, where now we are trying to look in at the, you know, um, GPCRs, uh, calcium handling proteins, prote uh, protein kinases, phosphatases. Uh, so we hope to integrate proteomic pentabolomics with in vitro in vivo function and clinical cardiology. And of course, you know, <laughs> top down proteomics is a great tool for um, precision medicine. You've got patients, you, you know, analyze these tissue samples and um, you can use the proteo PTM expression levels as integrated biomarkers to better segregate patients for precise and personalized treatment. And over the years, my lab has developed a strong collaboration with the industry. So we have a very strong academic industrial partnership. 
And uh, we recently have also performed top lomix, yes, spend time antibody drug conjugates, et cetera. So in conclusion, I really would like to thank my uh, students. They are really talented, and without them, all this would not be possible. I'd like to thank uh, my funding agencies, and thanks, Brooker, for you know, their instruments, and thank you so much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have.